Well, hello, everybody. My name is Greg, and this time for another episode of Ask... Mom? And Dad. We're so glad to be back with you, <laughs> and I'm so glad that you're glad to be here as well. We want to thank the studio audience, which... In our world of artificial intelligence, we know that's really what this was, was an artificial studio audience. But we know that wherever you are right now, you are clapping and cheering and hooping and hollering. And we want to thank you for that because we deserve all the hooping and hollering. No. We no, need we all the hooping yeah, and go. hollering that we can get. <laughs> definitely don't deserve it, but yeah. definitely need it. Well, if you're a listener out you know, there and yes, you're with us right now, we are just shock and awe. No, that's a different thing. We are just amazed or honored. <laughs> well, thanks for listening, Mom. Anyway, um, for the rest of you out there, however many there may be, we want to thank you for joining with us today. Last time we talked about what it was like to be married for 36 years and if you didn't pick that up from the last episode, we're still trying to understand what it's like to be married for 36 years because, yeah, well, we really can't. We're past almost. that. We can no longer wonder what it's like to be married for 36 <laughs> years because we are now working on 37 years, which is now when we get to next yeah, year, we'll be don't going, do that. wait, You're is it 37 me. or yeah, 38? No. How are you doing today, Tanya? Um, okay. Nothing gets your ire up? I mean, uh, you good? Are you, what's exciting? When I say ire, I meant that, that sounds more like an... <laughs> Like, are what you am I angry, angry about? about today? What are you angry about today, I'm Tanya? I'm I'm not starting the day angry. But I've avoided you most of the day, so I know I haven't made you angry, but I'm sure something has. That's not. How do you know that? I don't Never know, actually. Else. You're in a good That's mood. A I'm in a decent mood. We Last week when we did this podcast, I didn't realize it at the time, but we were, I was at least a little bit under the weather. And so it was kind of, because I mean, considering <laughs> how loopy. I feel today, I don't, yeah, loopy. I not <laughs> Loopy, under the weather means you can come off as if you're on some sort of substance. But I wasn't on any other substance. I just was not feeling great. It seems to be going around. Good Everyone I've know. talked to has been sick for one reason or another. Tried to tell somebody I wasn't going to make a meeting because I wasn't feeling good. And they texted me back that they weren't going to be making the meeting either because <laughs> they weren't feeling good. Which means that the third pinch hitter for the... <laughs> the it was Anyway, I want to talk about something that's got the ire up. <laughs> okay. See, see, I was on that, but I don't know if that was your ire or anything like that. But, you know, hey, <laughs> anyway, where was I at? We were, I want to talk about immigration and um, and what it means to be. Since the, it's a popular subject, like on all the newsreels these days. Yeah, we don't we don't get into politics. Well, that's not true. We probably do cross the line into politics a lot because the whole idea of. Uh, well, as it don't talk about religion <laughs> or politics in a conversation means what's left to talk about. Especially I mean, with us. the weather. And so basically, <laughs> you know, which can be, you know. Because well, even children and marriage, you still end up talking about politics. That's somehow. right. Well, and, and honestly, definitely about they say don't talk faith. about religion or politics, but now the weather is politics. Yeah, so that's true. There's, there's, no, right. way, there's no way. There's no way around the fact right. that no matter what you do, uh, you're going to be talking about politics. So what's the other thing? Weather, sports. Nope. Also politics. Yeah. <laughs> are you going to kneel since or we, are you going to stand? Since we know so much about sports, you know, uh, yeah. anyway. I, I, I think that ultimately what our government and our culture has managed to do is to make it so that we can't talk about anything at all without <laughs> causing problems. Without it being polarizing, right. as and, it were. And especially this issue, I think I wanted to talk a little bit about this. And I, and I wound up, got, I got interested in the subject matter because the question that's being thrown out at us in a political whirlwind is we can't call people illegal. Well, to me, that's kind of like, duh, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, but it's being used so much. I can't hmm. help but think that it's persuasive for some who may not be thinking critically about what they're hearing in the news. And so the, thus the yeah. title of today's program, um, are people illegal? Well, the problem with our country these days is they make everything sound like it's going to be also religious or faith-based. They're going to make it moral somehow and condemn you if you disagree with them based on your faith, not based on a political view or an understanding of law. That's the problem. I mean, that was true even back in the COVID spot there that we had. We had to deal with whether or not we were condemned as not good people, if we chose against what the government declared was the best for us, you know. Well, so yeah, it's and all this COVID is stuff. a really good example of just how far the um, inability to honestly have dialogue about something that might be uncomfortable to talk about, like what we can or can't trust or what we believe, now, doesn't mean that the conversation or what the Bible isn't happening. Says, yeah, it, or what kinds of freedoms we should have based on our understanding and our belief systems, but not. As in being condemned by the, someone else's view of morality. 
that's what I guess I'm trying to say. Right. They are and, blurring those lines these that, days. And that never really was an issue. It's kind of interesting because in the political dialogue, it seems like, you know, you're not allowed to have um, conversations. They would say it would disrupt Thanksgiving dinner. You know, go home and disrupt your, your family and have a political <laughs> discussion over what you think about a certain candidate or whatever. But the reality is I think most of us who have good relationships are having those conversations anyway. The, where we run into it is how it do we... Does us. Well, sure it is, but I'm saying where we run into it is we don't know how to approach a stranger or someone who's outside of yeah. our window of um, relationships. So they're trying to more and more... Not, and COVID, we could even do that conversation at some to some degree. COVID went a long way to isolating Americans from one another a little bit more so than than we have seen well, in our and history. Well, and polarizing again our belief systems about our own freedoms and our own understanding of our own law in our country. That's what I'm trying to say. And I think that's what you're getting at here. It is. It is, definitely. I, I think, though, for us to talk about um, illegal immigration or legal immigration or immigration or foreigners coming from land to land, I think we need to have a conversation about what the Bible says about how we treat one another. Because on the religious front or, this, or the biblical front, we have people who are good-meaning, well-meaning people who are Christians who side on both sides of this argument, meaning that anyone can come into the country, we should be kind to all folks, and people are not illegal. That's where that statement comes from. So therefore, if people manage to find their way to America, um, then <laughs> they're just here, deal with it. No matter what discretion, and we shouldn't really exercise much discretion over it, which has led to a lot of stuff in the news about this whole, like the... Um, Lake and Riley murder um, and other kidnappings and rapes and crime that's happened because people have crossed our borders well, without permission. And one of the things that I read the other day, if you think about it, what's 1% of, what is it, was it 11 million people we think has crossed our border right now? That's still, what, over 600,000 something? I think it was 11 point something and it was like 600. That, that are, if it's only 1% of illegals that are criminal with ill intent toward our country, that's still a huge number and mm -hmm. can impact a large part of well, that's the problem. The world we live Our in. legal system's completely upside down anyway, because the word illegal itself means they shouldn't be here without proper um, means or protocol, of which most everyone in this country, whether it was our generation or five or seven generations ago, had to go through to come into this country. So it's ridiculous to think now that we can just negate all that, that our laws don't mean anything. Right. And our laws have not meant anything in a couple of different areas for a little while now in our from our government down rather than so that's what's confusing to me. How we we're not even supposed to just this last week we heard we, we really shouldn't even use the word illegal. It's undocumented or and let's go further. Let's call them newcomers. <laughs> well, let's not let's not even declare what or, what it means to have status as a legal citizen in mm -hmm. our country. Now it should just be blurred. And it is is becoming so blurred that the people in our own country cannot get help or uh, say health care or things like that before the uh, illegal ones who are handed money, handed uh, all these different things, even to that point, even right. to be handed health care. I heard somebody the other day like that. that doesn't have their driver's license say they could drive now because they can just identify as undocumented driver. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's... If the scary truth is they're even trying to pass a, I forgot it was California or New York, trying to pass something that says they can vote. I mean, what is being a citizen in this country then? We're completely negating right. a citizen, anything a citizen it means to be by, a citizen. By default, understanding a citizenship is that they're a stakeholder. There's someone who has a vested interest in the in the well-being of the nation of the country that they live in, and they've 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 been a part of it. Now that's a obviously that's a definition, but it's one of the things that crosses my mind. People who've come here from other countries. Now I I want to be real clear. We have different definitions of what even illegal immigration looks like. You've got criminals, which is what's highlighted in the news and that kind of things. You've got people who are just coming here for economic benefit. They may be well-meaning in their desires, but they're choosing a pathway here that's not docu that's not legal. Mm -hmm. And then you have actual the, what the intention of this asylum. process is: asylum seekers. And we have mm -hmm. friends yeah, who came here know, as asylum seekers. And so yep, I want to be real clear about that. Literally running we away have, from the we have friends who were, Yeah, we have friends who are illegals. So just so you know, we can talk about it now because we have friends who are illegals. <laughs> and they aren't anymore. And they aren't anymore. <laughs> they went, they through, went the through the process. process. They went through the <laughs> asylum process, which. This what? is 30 years ago plus that these people mm -hmm. went through and that. And it took them quite a while. And they literally were. They were their child, One of their um, oldest child was about to be um, 
hauled off in a truck to fight in the Sandinistan wars back in the day, and they decided they needed to get out of there before their child came to to the risk of his life. And so, and we there heard, are reasons. I heard That's just, a political asylum yeah, issue that makes sense. I heard just this morning with all the uprising in Haiti that we've just heard about, that in reality, there are some from there that we probably should offer at least some assistance of some sort, maybe even a few of them could be rescued. Um, but we're not going to be able to do that because our borders are so open right now. We're going to have to we're going to have to clamp down on ones we know might actually bring, uh, you know, criminal behavior. That type of thing that would be kind of chaotic. We're going to have to watch that, and they'll probably come through Florida. And Ron DeSantis is really watching yeah, those and border. clamping down on that. And yet, some of the other borders we haven't even had the freedom or the right to choose and say who can come through and start their legitimate work toward legal citizenship. The problem is it's so out of control right now. So what what were you learning this morning that you wanted to Well, there's a bunch kind of, of things we can talk about. What some of the <clears throat> stuff we looked at together like, you know, one of the first questions that comes to mind is if the world is an open border if we're all supposed to be one nation under one world <laughs> under God. Yeah, one world then, government. Then the question yeah. comes to to and and which is, Admittedly, Adam and Eve walked in the garden. There was just a few number of folks, and they were under a relationship. But then sin entered into the world um, over um, just de- over a desire that God had not desired, wanted for His people, and uh, the world went to <laughs> from that point forward. You know, here's my no. I was going to do this one. <laughs> That's the one. That's what happened oh, to the world. And, uh, I have, I have a, a, a I'm, okay. Crickets, stop. <laughs> the, the world went south. And so, but the question that came to my mind, and and I read an article about it even further this morning, but the question that comes to my mind is, well, isn't the Bible full of borders? Mm-hmm, right. I mean, how, how many different ways can you well, think about it? of speaking to a foreigner or a whatever, there's lots of different instructions given about foreigners and different things. So God was acknowledging borders and, uh, in fact, at one point talking about not moving ancient border lines and things like that because it was... It was somewhat sacred, but it was also something he saw. We heard just a few minutes ago about the Tower of Babel. He intentionally divided out people into nations that didn't even speak the same language for the reason, for their own sake, but mostly also so that they would not rise up and cause destruction that would that would overshadow um, God's work in their life, right? And, right? and become God to them. So, Well, and you think about the original command that the Lord gave Adam and Eve when they left the garden. He said to be fruitful and multiply and to uh, across, fill the earth. And to fill the earth. Mm-hmm. That by anybody who has a relative that lives more than a few hours away by car understands that it's very difficult, modern technology aside, it's very difficult to really be engaged in that family member's life when you're separated at that distance. So the proclivity or the desire oftentimes of human beings is to stay together. And Babylon's an example of that. The The world didn't didn't expand and take over. They, they moved moved to some distance as far as crowding forced it. Yeah, but by the time that went around, they, disobeyed him. <laughs> they desired to build a tower that would celebrate their own ability to be a one nation under themselves. <laughs> they had nothing to do with under God. And God's chief desire for separating the people and confusing their languages was to force them to do what he originally told them to do, go out across the, the world, establishing and, and conquering yeah. and, and, and governing and managing the planet as you were told to do. Now, this wasn't going to be pretty. Mm-hmm. And as it as Noah <laughs> <laughs> tells us, you know, it wasn't pretty because ultimately the world is, is flooded. I know I got them backwards, right? yeah. but that's fine. I'm just trying to say, but Noah's the, even well, out of order, the, the example was after was the there. flood. He had already it, declared it was even worse. Yeah, they were women coming together. Or, Men and women, everything about this world had become corrupt. It was wicked, was the word I was looking for. Yeah. Um, So then after, even after the flood, after it destroyed all, and he gave them that specific instruction, they still went right against him. Yeah, there's there's this, there's this, one of the things I thought was interesting was um, how we as human beings today's love genetically modified or um, organics, which in, you know, food with GMOs. Organisms. Organisms. Organic, organic organisms. <laughs> okay, anyway, we do that to our food. Basically, we take something, we break it down and engineer it how we want it to be. Well, that the article, the writer of this article said that we like that about God's word. We like to take God's word and gene- genetically engineer it for our own benefit, how we think it makes sense. Mm-hmm. And that's an evident action of what it is there. But moving forward, those nations go out, they establish their borders, they establish their boundaries, they establish laws and governments 
All of these things exist all the way up until you get to Israel. When they move out, what do they go? So that a land can be given to his people. That land, the first thing they do when they come into that land was they divide it up and put borders around the land and where it's supposed to be and how it's broken up. Borders have always been a part of how you define a nation state. And so the idea of, and with that border thing comes instruction on how that nation state interacts with its neighbors and those that are coming through. What is it, what is expected when you come from one country to another as to regard with how that country's culture and laws and those kinds of things make sense. If I leave yeah, here, yeah, if I leave America and I go somewhere else and I break a law there that's legal in America, but not legal there. I'm subject to the laws of that country, right. not to the laws of the country for which I came from. Now I can declare myself a citizen and try to petition, but that may or may not work. Well, and that was one of the, uh, well, the reasons that God declared to his people when he called out Abraham and set apart them to not intermarry and to not, to not basically to uh, bring other nations into that uh, integration there. Because there were so many different things that God had set up for them to know about him and to understand in his way. So for to bring in other nations was to either bring in other nations' gods, other other understandings of the supernatural, other ways that they ple- wanted to please their gods and things like that. So, so it caused them to be, um, like you just explained, but confused and not to know which ones then to honor. So... God had said originally, don't even do that. Don't mess with it. Be unto me a people set apart, which is a nation that, that the idea of those boundaries. Those words by themselves denote some sort of definition of what a, what surrounds that nation, what defines it. Yeah. Definition of something is a boundary you place around it. Even if it's just a verbal definition, we are a people of the book, you know, we're the people of the Torah. We are people who adhere to that. That's a even while that's not a physical definition. A, a boundary? It's a we, boundary, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Israel existed, exi- Israel existed as nomads in the desert for a lot of time. They lived in other countries, but they still maintained their culture within the laws of the country in which they live. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 13 about governments being um, given to us for our good. At the time of his writing, he's writing in a Roman culture that's got really messed up laws. But so far as those laws don't violate directly the word of God and the Israelites were allowed to live and the Romans even understood and that allowed Israel to live with some modicum of self-government in order that they might be peace in that region. So there was, there was still, though, an adherence to Roman law. For example, the Jews did not have the authority to, um, to execute, not under Roman law. So in order for Jesus to be put on a cross, they had to appeal to Rome that Jesus was a threat to the emperor. And that's how they got him killed. That's how they got him put on a cross. And You're so, saying the Jewish uh, laws did not allow them to execute? The Roman laws did not allow the Jews to execute people. Oh, interesting. But the Roman laws would allow Romans to execute people. Right. So you could be, you could be put um, up as, okay. as committing a crime, but it would have to rise to the standard of Roman laws for it to be a capital punishment offense. Mm-hmm. In other words, the Romans told the Jews when they said, he's just yeah. one of your prophets. Why do we care? That was what they put up first. So they had to make the argument that he was a threat to the Roman emperor. That he could he would cause an uprising, that he would be a threat to the overall um, allegiance to the Roman emperor. That where the Jews were saying we were not, we're not, we're obeying, we're doing what Caesar wants us to do, and and so. But Jesus, on the other hand, he's going to bring up an army and try to overthrow Caesar, which some of his followers wanted him to do. That's why is it some of his disciples abandoned him at, at that night. He was arrested because they thought he wasn't going to do what they thought he was going to do. That was the expectation of the Jews, was somebody who'd come in strong enough to overthrow Rome. Interesting, because Jesus himself, that would be one place he really did hold strong. Even we see that um, the Canaanite woman came to him, and he talked about having come to the Jews, and that he, um, I forgot the quote, but uh, that he had only come to the, the children of Israel, so that he wouldn't wasn't going to entertain her until she showed such faith. And then... Because of her faith, uh, which was a odd interaction actually, when he when she says even the um, dogs eat what is thrown from the ma- master's yeah. table or whatever, and and he says, "Woman, because of your faith, you, you can be healed." Um, <clears throat> but he was acknowledging that the those boundaries had been set up for a reason. Now, ultimately, he um, had already said the Gentiles would be included in that gospel invitation, but it wasn't 
for that time at that moment for him to, um, he knew the different processes that had to go through, I guess, before they were going to reach out to the Gentiles. But so that's interesting because that's kind of a statement of those boundaries are given for a reason. Those nation uh, identifications or whatever. Well, the reality is this in Adam and Eve's garden, they walked with God. And so his yes was their yes. His no was their no. When things went along, what needed to be done was, was dependent on their tight relationship with him. And because that existed there, there's no evidence that there was anything more than that. However, since then, since the world fell and man decided to take matters into his own hand, God has spent the rest of creation helping them define, <clears throat> excuse me, and shape uh, structure around them so that they don't destroy themselves. One of the concerns that Adam and Eve, you know, that, excuse me, that happens at Babel and any other time in history where mankind, you know, tries to be a one nation, you know, Hitler, Mussolini, we go back through, you know, Genghis Khan, let's see who else was, uh, Alexander the Great, Napoleon at one time, all these guys trying to take over at least the world as far as they understood it. They believe they had the best solution for all mankind. Well, guess what that is? <laughs> right. That's humanism. Yeah. That's not God. And so there's purpose in the nations being divided it in the sense that the we top have top. to kind of work together. Because, And honestly, even culturally, the reason things have developed differently worldwide is because geography is different, mm -hmm. which means that the way people have had to choose to interact with their, their world around them has had to been different. And so we have to learn to work together in a global sphere, which is something we've not been... To some degree, the internet is the modern Tower of Babel, right? We can all connect and communicate with each other, but we couldn't, we couldn't do that before. But <clears throat> that's something, that, that's a thought. Leave that one hanging for no apparent reason. But there are laws in place in each and every country in, that, um, that give, help us to govern where, the gov where our country stand on the world, uh, stand in the light of the world polit politic and how we interact with our own nation. And one of those things is what a border is. And we have laws about what it means to come into our country or not to come into our country. So the first thing to say is, is someone illegal? Well, no, the person themselves isn't illegal, but the person is, if they're coming across the border without- <laughs> Acting If they're illegally. acting <laughs> against the laws, they have broken the law and there needs to be response to that equal to the offense. So someone coming across, you know, you've got in this whole thing, you got people who are being deported and brought and coming back over and over again. So there's there's mm -hmm. all kinds of different things that are bigger than this conversation. But I really want to say that the first reason that I would say no, the person's not illegal, but legal, but they broke the law that makes them acting in illegal. There's nothing wrong with calling someone illegal, uh, not by their identity, but to identify their actions as an illegal alien is something right. that's as an illegal alien. Because in the country spoken from, they are acting in an illegal manner according to the laws of that land. Mm -hmm. Like we have said, you, you're you talking about if you go to another country and you disobey or violate something there, you're subject to those laws. You're not... Uh, the problem, again, <laughs> basically stops there. If, if they're violating our laws, that every one of them need to be dealt with. Now, I agree, there are some situations that need to be have some compassion and and set a, on the protocols given to get through citizenship is where compassion lies. I mean, okay, sure, y you need to prove that well, the reason you're here and you know what's going on or whatever. And and usually our laws have been that they can stay, which is kind of ridiculous, but stay in our country until they've shown those Away things trial. and they've mm -hmm. yeah come to court to prove these things. The the part that's hard and and. The part where that's chaotic right now is that the ones who are are also going to act outside of our other laws, not just the laws of coming into our country, are not going to adhere to court. They're not going to come back. They're not going to. They're going to go immediately and do whatever they want, and likely put our own people in jeopardy. And right. that's what the government is supposed to do: is protect our own people. Right. The, the government's first of job all. is to protect its people. Instead, it seems like what we're dealing with today is the idea of. Um, empowering the uh, or inviting the process by e either being loose in our guarding of the border or by um, promising benefits for those who would come. And, uh, you know, th there's a running joke right now that if you want to get a job in America right now, it's easy. You just leave the country, renounce your citizenship and come back over illegally and you can get a job. Right. That's a funny joke, kind of. Well, but it's a little, there's a little bit of truth in it. The sad part of it is it may not even be, I don't know about a job, but they'll hand you gift cards. They'll hand you a phone, supposedly. They'll hand you um, 
or I think credit cards, whatever, and put you, fly you even to whatever place you want to go. Sure, that sounds great. Let's let's go across the border and come back. <laughs> it's it's really literally putting. I I want to correct myself on this story that I was talking about Jesus because it was actually the lady's daughter that she was coming to um, ask Jesus to heal, but also the fact that he he was addressing just like we're saying. I I came to take care. <clears throat> Of the, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Basically, Jesus was going to deal with and try to reach his own family, his own countrymen. Right. So he defines first. in that statement that there's a difference. Right. And then she came and knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. And he says, it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to their dogs. Um, and she says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. So she's acknowledging, yes, I don't, I don't deserve, I'm, I'm humbly admitting I don't deserve what Israel has, has got. I'm not of these people um, and you are for them or, you know, toward them. But she was showing uh, t- to me a submission to who they were and their understanding. Of course, at that point, the Israelites really weren't accepting him either, but he came to, to reach them first. But she was showing them um, a submission to who they were mm-hmm. and then an understanding of their God who sits right in front of her and wants, and she wants healing from him. So that to me shows also that the idea of coming across the border, um, we don't mind. The problem is you submit to our laws. Yeah. So the first of our laws is you don't come across the border except so, that you a- abide by the rules set to be a, you know, to become a citizen eventually. The whole, the, the whole stay in Mexico policy was a, was a good deal. I don't know how, how much it helped Mexico itself, but that was supposedly one that um, President Trump had put in place in order to save some of our citizenship and citizenry people, whatever, from danger. Because the bottom line is, we don't know who's coming through. We haven't vetted them. We haven't been able to fully understand. And we've heard recently that a lot of gang um, leaders and maybe even Middle Eastern uh, you know, terrorist leaders and such that we've dealt with in the past and has truly destroyed our own people well, like are I coming mentioned, through and we don't even know. Of those who cross the border, even if it's just 1% or people with that ill intent with the numbers that we've had in the last three years, mm. you know, the 600 plus thousand possible criminals just on 1% alone. Yeah. And so that's <clears throat> for whatever it could be. And you're, it's, it's old as the day is long if you want to destabilize the country. Um, you just put people in there who have cultural differences. They, that's ancient practice. It's not mm-hmm. something that's new. None of the, none of the things that are happening that's to us is new. That's what mostly concerns me. But one me, of the because I'm afraid that our current administrative government is is doing this on purpose in a sense to cause a chaotic uprising of some sort that destabilizes our our way of life here. I don't know if it's intentionally to disrupt and cause harm, or it's just there aren't there's not enough of a principle of an overarching um, American citizens are, are the first, you know, of the duties of the responsibility. Yeah. yeah. Um, rather than whatever it is, the bribes, the money that coming in, I don't, I don't guess I should accuse anyone, but, or of just the fact that they would like more offset of the um, lines for census lines and stuff that would cause representatives to go out of whack, all that stuff I've heard. Right, recently. that's and there's that brings another one of the issues is it, when our, we need to pray for our legislatures to create laws um, that that can define these things that you just mentioned. You know, flooding or maybe because be the demographic the demographic issue just because our, since our census only counts people who are um, excuse me our, dem, our census citizen. only counts people who are just by people they don't count whether you're a citizen or not mm. used to but not since the 2020 census and the, um, and then which can cause the rise or fall of the number of representatives in any given era area. That's one problem. And, but the problem that we have now is we've got in our government structures, there's more than one way to beat a law. And one of them is the executive branch failing to enforce the laws that are already on the books. So we're constantly having conversations about something like gun control and registrations or something like that. When in reality, a lot of the things they're talking about in the news cycles are things that already exist. Yeah, They're just creating a buzz or division between us. And then there's the state divisions, the states who are trying to rise up and protect their own borders for their own citizens. 
it seems as if that is a toggle between the state and the national. And that is a, that's a true question mark, I guess. Because yes, we have a country of states, but we also have individual states and governing structures in those states, which are called to protect their own people. So there's a big question mark when you have a conflict there of ideology, maybe. I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't understand it. I don't understand why our laws don't seem to mean anything to our current administration so that so much so that they can ignore them enough um, even when the states rise up and say we need protection we're having all kinds of issues or struggles I, I don't get it because I know that so many ideologies clash and I'm not saying one is right or not another but I do believe that it is a real something to really consider when we're um, this next election cycle for sure that people are going to need to speak their voice. They're going to need to stand up. And I'm afraid it's too late as far as some well, of our infiltrations of, we've even heard there's a lot of uh, Chinese and um, different, n- not just like Southern, uh, South America and Central America people no, they're who coming we from would think of like world. as drug lords yeah. and that kind of thing. But the the different types of cultural influences and then the types of infiltrations we've heard through stuff like TikTok and things like that, it is, it's concerning because it does seem as if, who are we as citizens of the United States? What do we have to say? Do we have a voice? Sure. And we're even heard, we're even hearing now that the Supreme Court is even kind of arguing about whether or not uh, our freedom of speech, our freedom of, you know, to kind of disagree is going to uh what what was the word um i don't know entangle the government or something you left cause my, them my to, conversation thought so i don't know what cause them to not be able to the basically gov- to yeah, restrict okay. their ability to the government has the right to express its opinion its versus own yeah. citizens that's what the problem is right now we feel like Foreign citizens actually have a bigger voice these days than even our own citizens. Let me let me swing back around to your illustration from the woman who begged for Jesus's um, help because I think it it applies to the question of whether people are illegal or not, and the question of whether or not I got to stop using whether people are illegal, whether such classification as an illegal immigrant or foreigner. Well, yes, there is. And the Bible expresses that as well, which I know it might surprise somebody. Yeah, and that's but not a racial statement. And that it's is not a not racial a, statement. It's a statement. It's of, not even a dehumanizing statement. It's a statement. It's a statement, factual statement. They are absolutely just in our country illegally. Well, and one of the best examples is found in the book of Ruth. And that um, there's there's a couple of different words that I was reading about this morning that, that you have the idea of a citizen, citizen uh, the Bible refers to a citizen or a countryman. And I, there's a Hebrew word for it, but there's also legal immigrants and foreigners. Um, foreigners are illegals in this case. A legal in- immigrant is someone who's a sojourner, or someone who's moved to the area, basically have come in by legal status that have, that have met the requirements of what it means to come and live in that land as a resident alien. But a foreigner is someone like, in this case, Ruth, who was a Moabite, and Moabites had been expressly forbidden to be um, in Israel. Uh, let's see here if I can find the scripture for that. I think this is a little different than our country. You're going to, I know you're going to talk I want to about make that. First is, because um, our country, you can marry and be legal citizen because you've married you one can, of the You can, but that's our laws. So that's that's right. our laws. I'm right. saying that's the point I that I want to make is, and I guess I failed to say this so I can tie this together real quick. The difference in the posture of the person who came to the door. Both, this woman said, basically, if you take what Jesus says to her, is, I come for my people. In other words, not now, not your turn. Or... It could be interpreted, I didn't come for you. Now, that's not what he's saying, because we know now in retrospect that he did. But she humbled herself and said, please, and she made a case. Mm-hmm. Okay? And in Ruth and Naomi's situation, Ruth falls before Boaz and makes a case as well, because she knows that she could be mistreated without regard because she was part of what was an actual enemy of the Israelites, the Moabites. But because of her situation, for whatever reason, he... Um, she fell on her face, Ruth 2.10. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner mm-hmm. or a non-legal res- someone who does not belong here? Mm-hmm. Now, granted, she came in with somebody that was, that did belong there. There was a lot of things you can make the case, but the point of the matter is, is she and the woman in this story both had a humble respect 
yeah. for what the what the authority was that they were putting themselves at the mercy of. That is absent in our current immigration situation. Yeah. These people that are crossing the border, by and large, are not coming with a, a respect. Now, we mentioned earlier when we opened about that we knew people who came here illegally running for their lives from another country. But they clearly demonstrated respect for the country when they got here by submitting to the processes yes, of um, asylum. So, you know, the question of is there someone, if, is there such thing to Israel? Does the Bible make a case for boundaries? Yes. Does the Bible make a case that there are people who should and should not cross those boundaries? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's there's an illustration for that. So there's clear law biblically. So what we have in our American system differs. We talked about, I used the GMO illustration. We like to genetically modify scripture for our own, our own benefit. Well, sure, our country and every country on earth um, there's no perfectly biblically sound country. Even Israel fell apart in its own attempts to do that. The, the United Kingdom lasted, what, two and a half kings? Mm -hmm. um, so, because we count Saul as a half king because he didn't quite finish his reign. Oh, that United Kingdom. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. The United yeah. Kingdom and Israel. Mm -hmm. right. And so, Saul, David, mm -hmm. Solomon's... <laughs> right. That's kind of mm -hmm. how it happened. That's my. That's all of that king's period in a nutshell as described by me. <laughs> so... Well, well, if people use the... Uh, the the biblical reference to love your neighbor as yourself. What do we think of as a neighbor though? We normally use that word as someone next door or nearby that we uh, may not even know, may not in that, in that case, it was Jesus with a Samaritan who was a, in a sense next door to them, but they were seen as um, not uh, of the same caliber or something like that. In the United States, we've never lowered someone as in a a sense of, you know, lowering their, their state of existence, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But we have seen that there are reasons why we have another country. We have a different place. So love your neighbor. Love someone who's hurting, someone who's in pain, someone who's needy of you. And, and think of yourself, um, you know, think of them like you would yourself. But in these cases, like we've talked about, how would you even think you would need to be treated if you're illegal as in not abiding by the laws of that law? And that's completely different than a random, you know, stranger on the uh, road who that was not the Samaritan. Actually, that was the Jew, I guess, who was who was sick. It was took the Samaritan to help him. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that that love your neighbor as yourself. We We think of that. That illustration and and just doesn't apply here. I don't think. I well, believe I think that, that we you might want to are consider, to give compassion, but we are. There are also a reason for our own borders. Go we ahead, talked sorry. about proximity earlier on. You know, when yeah. when we live, your neighbor by definition, a neighbor is someone that you know or someone that is near to you. And it's not just a random person that's far, far away. Because the Bible um, in Proverbs and pretty much throughout, we just referenced Ruth, and there are people who are not neighbors that are clearly people that are enemies. And there's there's um, example after example of people who put themselves at odds against odds against Israel. There was battles, wars. The Bible's right. full of it all. And the Bible and, said to be cautious about the wolf in the sheep pen or the. There are um, plenty of statements that that say that not everyone who is in proximity to you is safe around you, mm -hmm. and we need to bear that in mind. What the concern here with the alien thing is we're, we're classifying everyone who comes across our border, be that legally or illegally or whatever, that everyone who comes in is our neighbor, therefore vulnerable because they've come from somewhere else <laughs> right. and they need the great American culture to survive them or help them survive. And so we've labeled them all as vulnerable. And the Bible does have a class of people called vulnerable class. It's uh, orphans, widows, and foreigners. It's and, and when it's talking about foreigners, there's two classes of foreigners, as I've just talked about. There's people who have come properly, and there's people who have come improperly. So the foreigners that are vulnerable are the ones that have come properly, and that's what the Bible's talking about. And Exodus twenty two twenty one: you must not exploit a foreign resident or oppress him since you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. That's brought up a lot in our political conversation. We should never exploit or oppress these people who are coming across our border. But Ugh. that's, again, we're making a blanket statement, using a scripture to make a blanket statement without critically looking at everything around that scripture. And let me say this now, if I've never said it before, which I know I've said it before, is you can't take one scripture and make your point. <laughs> you have to look at the entirety yeah, of the scripture. Deuteronomy even gives a outline for what it should mean to take care of aliens who come across a border, be it legally or however. If you find yourself across someone who is 
in your midst. You know, you need to make judgment as how to regard that person. Yeah. Deuteronomy says that when you when you are done, Deuteronomy twenty four nineteen, when you're harvesting your field and you accidentally leave something behind, it says, don't bother to go back and pick it up. Let the resident alien, by the way, there's that legal alien, resident alien, the fatherless and the widow come and pick it up. So the Lord may bless the work of your hands. He's saying, be considerate of those who are a vulnerable class. Now, clearly a criminal or someone who has no regard for your law or your land, that's not vulnerable. That's an enemy. That's an attacker. That's someone who's dangerous to you. Mm -hmm. And so for us to take a group of, gosh, in this case, like I said, what, 11 plus million people, who've crossed our borders and presume all of them defenseless. Well, some of them crossed massive amounts of territory to get here. That's not defenseless behavior. That's aggressive behavior. You just, you know, <laughs> if they're defenseless. They might've been a, well, children. I mean, okay. The children question, we can have that conversation too, but yeah, that's an well, entire different subject. Yeah, matter. it is. And we wouldn't say, obviously that you wouldn't treat them like you would want to be treated. And who, whoever you come across, doesn't even matter. Even in a fearful situation you're going to try to love them like jesus would you're going to give them whatever the the problem is the first step the problem is um just as we would send foreign missionaries into areas that are needy we we know the kindness and care that we're to give but when it's an invasion that is not and and if you say you were to protect the the bible's really clear that you can protect your own home and your own children and your own um, situation first and then offer hospitality that's not we're not even saying that we don't ever do that we're right. saying that it is okay for a nation to have a boundary and have a way to um, protect its own people at the same time as allow well, people to come an in example in the of right discernment, way just with our given our circumstances right from our an example of discernment like i already mentioned kids have been brought across the border for whatever reason, and there's things going on. There's people who come across the border and surrender immediately to authorities. And then there's what we're called the get the getaways or gotaways, right? What might you initially think to yourself about someone who wants to, are willingly surrendering themselves versus people who do not want to be detected at all? Yeah. I mean, if you're making just a snap judgment between you and the people that you live around, your first thought is going to be what? That the people who are trying to evade law are trying to evade law for a reason. They probably have already been here once before, or there's a criminal record behind them or a criminal record in the States yeah. because we sometimes deport people for criminal records versus mm -hmm. putting them in jail. So, so likely showing discernment about what a does. neighbor truly is. Now, if somebody comes into the country, even illegally, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt that people crossing, there's, as many people who've come across this country because they think it's okay to come in illegally because that's the message that's being sent as there are people who've mm -hmm. crossed this border with maybe nefarious thought processes. Yeah. So that leads us to the, I guess the last question for this process is how should we as Christians talk about this and how should we deal with the question that we've really started into already, which is how do we deal or define these folks as our new neighbors in this case or the people, the foreign foreigners that live among us that <laughs> may very well be vulnerable because when it comes to the children and those kinds of things, I think we've got a whole nother mobilization that has to take place for the protection of those children. Well, like you said, discernment is is a big deal. Helping orphans and widows is definitely something. We know the, the people on the front lines of trying to help the uh, trafficking and uh, stop that criminal horror um, obviously are caring for the children, the children who are exploited and, and not, you know, don't have a choice in their own. We're going to give compassion when we need to give compassion. And then we need to put our guard up for the times when it's wise to put our guard up. The Bible talks about discernment for a reason because you, there are definitely um, evil forces at work as well. And we know that if God gives us um, the wisdom and the you know momentary or whatever uh, opportunity, I guess, to defend our country, our families, our, our rights of freedom in our own country, and that's to me. That's that's where we apply that. We we use compassion when He tells us to. Right. And each one of us, I think that's what God has put in our country. Probably why we're in this boat to begin with, because they kind of prey on our um, the kindness of our hearts, which we believe if we were serving Jesus, that's what is first. Yeah, we do make we do tend to make the mistake as Americans. Um, that we believe that the culture that we enjoy is the same culture yeah, we give in every other country, of the doubt. <laughs> which, you know, if we, we see, you know, in a country, in a country that may um, glorify, let's just go to the islands, 
that one of our friends was a missionary at, where headhunting is still a, a thing. Yeah. You know, and they come to America and they decide to ignore our laws and suddenly start headhunting. Well, nowadays, they may or may not get arrested for it. They may find some reason. But nonetheless, the, the reality is that's not someone who is in, someone we can easily minister to. Well, and then we know also that there's the Muslim lands that are literally out to completely annihilate the Jews because they cannot uh, usher in their own Messiah if they don't. So if we're allowing that kind of thought pattern or that kind of people group to have their culture in our lands, then immediately we're in a... Europe uh, is already suffering from allowing that to happen. Yeah, both and France we're in a and Germany set of, of are both struggling enemy. with that particular people group by allowing them to practice and have entire sectors where they have Sharia law or whatever. So... Yeah. The, that the governmental side of all of this that number one we can pray for our leaders right we can we if you're if you're called to please do not shy away from running for office i'm not it's not something i've been called to do but if you're However, called to, i think you should probably go and be a chaplain to the uh, somewhere those, those yeah. called to office well, yeah. yeah and where god gives me that opportunity <laughs> so i will pray for that <laughs> well we lived in washington state it was even so separated out there we knew a couple people who prayed on the hill there with um uh, for capital, that capital, for, right, literally yeah, right on the, the capital steps, just out the door, that they managed to have a house. Uh, pray yeah, for organizations. That brings to mind also other things. You pray for organizations that have those particular ministry callings on the mm -hmm. political side, because yeah. there are God. I know this is hard to believe, but I want to say there are godly men and women who are trying to make a difference in this country by serving in those political places of office. The point, of, the are. problem is the they are. Place. They have other people there who have, as we've just, just in this conversation alone, have been talking about have different ideas as to what an alien is someone who comes across the border illegally or not. I've, I've talked to pastors who I'm friends with and acquaintances with who just throw out the government entirely in their mind, call themselves, I guess, politically homeless or whatever, because they don't like the way policy sounds when it's barked at them from the local news or from the national news. And we have to also understand that what you read in the headlines is not enough. I, I read you an article this morning. I don't remember what it was about. I remember me reading it to you and saying, listen to this headline. And I read you the headline. Then I read three paragraphs down and it said the opposite. Yeah. Well, of the headline. it's not the full <clears throat> truth. The bottom line is we're never going to hear through the press, at least the full truth. No. But to pray for these leaders, to pray and know that some of them are really fighting. Some of them are, have given into the evil likely and are um, bribed or whatever, but we pray for them as well. And we pray that God, God is the one that wins, that God in would have the, the glory Absolutely. in this God country wins. and that we would be turning back to him, that we would be our own selves repenting as a nation of the ways we've offended him, such as our um, own laws of abortion and such, which has um, desecrated our own people. But okay. Lord, um, we know that you, you are in charge and you will be victorious. We pray that we can stand with you when that, day comes and that this country can turn its eyes back to you as a uh, repentant of our own flaws and faults, but also that we would ask for your protection to stay with us, Lord, as we bless Israel and you promise to protect and watch over us, those who um, bless Israel. Lord, I pray we stand with them. We pray stand with the people groups of the ones who stand with you. And Lord, I just pray that you would guard us from the ones who want to destroy that. And in Jesus' name, I pray these things. <laughs> okay, well, amen. I mean, I agree. I was going to say, now, is that, that a segue to the, the last topic I wanted to talk about in this, or should we wrap it up here? Um, or maybe we can do this in another one. But what I wanted to talk about was, um, so the, I talked about how we can pray for our politics and those kinds of things. But I'm also thinking about now, what do we, the two questions I wanted to answer today was, the, what are there borders slash boundaries as governing authorities, which we've been talking about a lot, and then what is our response? We've talked a little bit about who is my neighbor, but I want to talk about it in the framework of missions because the reality is we have people who've come to our country from everywhere. And some, many, many of them, um, uh, an article that I was reading says, good motiv motivations, people are coming to provide for their families, better life, poverty, all sorts of reasons. The reality is, as we've been discussing, the law is the law and that's not how you get here. And there's reasons, there's other things that it causes when you have a flood of people like that, you can literally cripple your own economy and that's, again, a legislative issue. But the reality is we have people among us in large numbers that we've talked about a number of times who are in many cases vulnerable because of whatever reason they're here looking for something better. And Galatians um, tells us to take care of them or to miss to, and, and the Great Commission doesn't 
hold back on go ye therefore. In some regards, we don't have to go to all the nations because they've all come to us. <laughs> so what, what would you say is, is our responsibility as missionaries in this case? Because well, we're two, missionaries. So how would you look at it I that way? Two, and I'll wrap up with that. Um, illustrations of that exact thing. One, when we were in Des Moines, Iowa, the summer we spent, summer missions, actually the summer we met, I worked with in the park um, various teenagers and, and ki- children's uh, ages. Uh, we did some different back of Bible club things um, with different groups. One particular group I remember um, was a Spanish speaking because they couldn't speak English. We couldn't co- uh, communicate with them. But we had a few, I think we had a few um, curriculum pieces in Spanish or something. We did a few things with them, even if it was just a few games and things to try to uh, relate. Oh, we had some Spanish Bibles, I think, that we were able to give out. I asked one point at one person, why, because they were calling this boy a wetback, which I had never heard that term before. I asked what that meant, and they just said, well, he's illegal. He's an illegal now, was alien. Was this the white people this calling him illegal, or was this his own people? I, calling I don't actually remember. I think it was his own people. I don't even think it. Yeah. It was just, just like to a be thrown clear. around. Yeah. Um, and he had a smile on his face. He wasn't offended by it. No, but I just yeah. thought it was interesting because I had never really encountered an illegal alien. That was, what, golly, how long has it been? 36 years ago, I guess. Yeah, it's, or not, it's not a new ago. problem. It's just a new crisis. No. Well, and it, that was my first encounter in Des Moines, Iowa. Still blew my mind. In the middle of the, the country. The literal middle of the country. And they were right up there. Why? Do you remember? I don't, I, don't, I don't honestly know. I think there was a pocket of them. Um, I remember, really, uh, they were do you remember even when we were in... Well. Go ahead. I'm what? sorry. What? I'm sorry. I think there were Laotians in the area too, and they weren't all legal. That was in Wisconsin. Was that Wisconsin? We dealt okay. with um, Laotians. But what I was going to say was, do you remember in Wisconsin also, we had a um, uh, one of our favorite restaurants that we were going to for quite a while and eventually found out that the man, they had to shut him down. It was a really great restaurant. They oh, shut yeah. him down. Everybody and it was because he that, was yeah. housing an, an employee in the illegals. Which, so I know that that has been an issue at various points and, and various degrees in our country. The problem is right now, like you said, it's going to upset the tidal wave, I'm afraid, because it's overwhelming our own population. Well, the other illustration I was going to give was the Venezuelan man who came by our property here where we're staying and asked if um, he did not speak one bit of English, but he knew how to use the phone interpreter uh, translator. So we communicated that way, which I thought was interesting, um, asking if he if I knew of any jobs in the area. We exchanged a little bit of information, and he eventually kept he kept asking me, and I had not heard of anything, and I he had checked a few places where I had suggested in town and couldn't find one. So he moved to Dallas, Texas, I think, um, got an offer somehow or heard of some job. Still kept texting me, but declared his faith in the Lord. Now, th- this is an interesting angle. that I don't, We didn't talk about this, but I saw something on a news broadcast the other day that I realized these people know, or some of them, and I don't know about Venezuela, I know how horrible their economy has been and some different really awful like gang things that we know some of them are infiltrating in our country, but I also know that you know their people probably need uh, our opportunities, whatever, that's not a problem. But what I realized watching something the other day is they know of our faith. Sure. They And they use it. We've even seen and know that our own homeless people kind of use that angle. They know of our faith. They so they know that compassionate angle. Christians this have guy, a reputation for being compassionate, you know, unfortunately compassionate yeah. without criticism. This guy that was trying to find that job was texting me all kinds of praising God and and saying how um he would be blessed by God. He was asking me to, you know, praying for me to be blessed by God. I thought that was interesting because I appreciate it, but it confused me a little. I didn't exactly know how to, I didn't doubt that he, that that's who he is. And yet now I, when I saw that on the news the other day, I realized that also can be a manipulation. But so we do have to be careful right? because they well, do know that about us. Let me, let me turn to the beginning of this and we'll wrap it up. They may be even coming to know Jesus. Well, it's coming, coming, it's, to our country. It's coming clear to me as, um, as we think about it, you're the only one, but of the two of us that actually had a run in, I, maybe it's happened in my life. I'm sure it has <laughs> with a, with a, um, someone that was an illegal alien in a group of people you were ministering to. Mm-hmm. The real question here is this, and I'll wrap up with what you, cause I know your answer is going to be, did that change the way you ministered to them? 
Absolutely not. If and anything, in fact, probably gave me more compassion okay. for him. And, I, and that's and what broke I, my heart at first because I thought, um, I thought of him as a at a disadvantage. Too, it, yeah. yeah, he was um, like a middle schooler. I thought of at, of him as a at a disadvantage at that point. He couldn't speak English. He was seemed like he couldn't interact like the rest. It's kind of funny because then when we were in living in Arizona, there was plenty of whole sex of completely speaking Spanish speaking people. So then it kind of, you know, watered down my understanding of who and where they can interact because they don't necessarily have to speak English. Right. That broke my heart because I do think if you're going to come to our country, you should learn to speak our language. That's that's the problem. The problem is we do have compassion, we do have kindness and we do welcome them. Right. But we welcome them almost to a fault. And that and I don't know who that's best for. I want to give them Jesus and I want them to know of my Jesus, but I don't want that to be used like the enemy would use it as a manipulation tool right. to to have whatever prosperity God has blessed us with. On the other hand, I don't I wouldn't want to restrict that from them being blessed by that if they, like we'd said, submitted to our own understanding of our country and of uh, what we stand for. And I want to I want to close with that because we've been at it for a little while. But the thing that I wanted to say to that is you have the right attitude. We can differentiate between being compassionate and loving of individuals because well let me just put it this way. There is no such thing as a person that is legal. We're all illegal. Every one of us <laughs> in this world have broken exactly. God's law and we live within the within the status of our brokenness or illegality, whatever. <laughs> Um, because of the grace of, of God. And and I can differentiate between a human being and the circumstances they find themselves within because of an, an being um, intentional or unintentional in breaking a law. Mm -hmm. And I can love someone, Jesus, just as he did with that woman who begged for his mercy when she asked him to minister to her, when he said, it's not time. I can love someone different and differentiating that she's outside or that person's outside of a status that's governmental or earthly. And I can still have compassion for them as the Imagio Dei, as the image of God, as a human being that is just mired in a broken world. And that's what you demonstrated with that young, that person, that young, young in, in the day. And even as you mentioned, um, others who've come with uh, language issues, it strikes me as you're telling that story that that same family that we started with, when they came here, Years later, the eldest of the family, the mom, still struggled with her English. And instead of just mocking her for that, you didn't say, you need to learn the language. What you did instead was in our worship team, she prayed in her native language for us every time you would want them to lead worship because you found it a blessing oh, for her absolutely. love for Jesus. Because at the end of the day, yes, for those of us who claim Christ, truly and earnestly, we are of one kingdom, one nation under God. Yeah. We're not looking forward to a kingdom that's established on earth because some human being figured out a great way. The name of that is Antichrist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's humanism. And what we are looking forward to is Christ's return and the establishment of his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we're looking forward yeah. to. It makes me think um, we need to pray for Franklin Graham too, who is doing specific, he did a specific um, crusade toward on the southern cities there in Texas, uh, all along the border, I think for that exact reason, to to point out that we are not, um, we're not saying build a border wall just so that we won't have to share our faith. We're saying we want to share our faith, but we want a way to uh, to help that um, transition be correct and done in the right manner to protect everyone. Anyway, yeah, all right, I agree. Well, it's been another Thank you, good David. podcast. Thank you for talking with me about this stuff because. It's on my mind. It's on the country's mind. And I think, you know, as we continue to follow Jesus, we'll do everything we can in this world to keep I on. Keep on. <laughs>